are dialing in from across Canada, I'm speaking to you from Toronto, and I would like to begin today's session by acknowledging the land where we live and work and recognize our responsibilities and relationships where we are. As we are meeting and connecting virtually today, I encourage you to acknowledge the place that you occupy. I and Maitri, uh, we are on the historical territory of the Huron-Wendat, Petun, Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit Indigenous Peoples. This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the lands and resources around the Great Lakes. With over 40% of Canadians living pay paycheck to paycheck, more employers are asking what they can do to increase the financial health of their staff. In today's session, Alex Mazur and Nora Beattie of Workplace Retirement Plan, Provider Commonwealth will share five good ideas to help you build financial security in the short and longer term. As an employer, you will come away with ideas you can take to reduce financial stress for your employees. As an individual, you will learn ways to make your hard-earned savings go further. Alex Mazur is co-founder of Commonwealth, a mission-driven business that works with associations, unions, and groups of employers to provide workplace retirement plans. Before Commonwealth, as Director of Policy to the Ontario Minister of Finance during the global financial crisis, Alex helped deliver major reforms to Ontario's retirement system, including laying the groundwork for the enhancement of the Canada Pension Plan. Nora Beattie is Commonwealth Director, Director of People Operations. She is passionate about people and connecting innovative people strategies to better business outcomes. This is a great pair for discussing this issue today. Their full bios and details and details about today's session um, are available on the handout that you can download. We put the link to it in the chat box. On the handout, you will also find today's five good ideas and resources. So without further ado, over to Alex and Nora. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, very grateful to be included in this, in this series. Uh, I just will put in a plug for those of whom, for whom it's the first five ideas a session you've attended. Uh, this is a fantastic resource there. You can go back on the website and see all the five ideas, uh, presentations and resources from, from past presenters. And I really enjoy going through uh, some of those and we encourage others to do that as well. Um, and I really appreciate the work that Maitri does in, in making that uh, accessible and freely available to, to so many people. Um, we're really excited to be here today. Uh, what gets us out of bed in the morning is um, actions people can take to strengthen financial health and improve financial security. And I have to say, I'm really heartened by the turnout today. Um, money is a hard thing to talk about. It's often something that people procrastinate about. And it's fantastic to see so many people today uh, attending. And I just want to say something, which is that even by attending a session like this, um, you know, you are taking an important first step. There's a lot of people struggling out there, and it may be your employees, it may be, it may be you. Um, you're taking an important first step to learning more about what you can do for yourself or others in your community uh, to help strengthen their financial security. So I want to just recognize that uh, as an important step that you're taking, you're taking time out of your day to attend, and I hope we can provide some value to you and the people that you serve um, through this session. Um, I, do, I do want to mention that uh, what we're going to present today will include a lot of ideas about how to strengthen uh, financial security. Um, this is really meant to be financial education as opposed to individualized advice. We don't have all the details about your situation or your employee's situation, so we're, we're going to try to provide some general rules of thumb uh, that we think are useful, uh, but this is, is education as opposed to uh, financial advice. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Nora um, and uh, we'll get started. Thank you. All right, so the, the first um, good idea that we're going to share is how to make a business case, either for yourself or if this is something that you need to do for your leadership team, for employee financial health. And I think what gets me really excited about this section of it is that I saw the same trend happening years ago around um, health benefits. It used to be something that was just sort of like a box to check off for most employers, but very few really looked into it. The industry was a little bit opaque. There weren't that many options out there. And over time, more and more employers started to realize that their employees cared about this and they, they could differentiate themselves from other employers and they could help their employees focus on their work by actually taking the time to look into the kinds of health benefits they provided. And what we saw was a huge shift in the market 
in terms of what was available. So there was, you know, the, the market really responded with creativity and innovation in terms of what was available um, from a health benefits perspective. And I'm really excited to see the same thing happen or start to happen in, in the um, case of employee financial health, because this is, you know, just as important, uh, we think anyway. And so there's sort of um, a few layers to this, uh, we're gonna call it a cake um, of financial security or building the case for financial security um, uh, in, in, empl in your employees um, workplace. The first is kind of acknowledging and accepting that there really is a crisis among Canadians today when it comes to their personal finances. I think it's being highlighted, perhaps amplified and aggravated by, you know, the pandemic, but it definitely existed long before and it will likely exist long after if we don't take um, intentional steps to address it. And just a few statistics that I wanted to um, share about this. There, there's a lot more information out there, but just some things that have really resonated with us is that almost half of Canadians, uh, I think Elizabeth mentioned this at the beginning, live paycheck to paycheck. That's a big number. Many Canadians who are near retirement, so they're actually getting closer and closer to retirement, have household savings of $3,000, which is just insufficient for their retirement needs. Um, a third of Canadians don't have access to a workplace-based plan. And we're not even talking about effective or tailored or efficient. We're just talking about access to a plan. That's a pretty big number. And then almost half, so four in 10 Canadians aren't saving at all. And these, these things are quite deeply related, but you know they should help um, convince you that this problem is real, it exists, and it's probably impacting people you work next to every day whether you are aware of it or not. The second piece is that even among those, so we're you know, saying, okay, there's a, there's a general financial crisis. Even among those who are saving, many Canadians struggle with retirement saving in particular. It's complex, the industry is a little bit opaque, the information isn't always readily available. And so this leads to frustration. And the reasons or the sentiments um, around the frustration can differ depending on age and stage. You know, they go from, they can range from things like when you've got sort of, if you have a younger workforce, it's it's so far away and there's so many more immediate things that people are worried about or interested in financially, whether it's dinner out with friends or a new sweater or whatever it is. Um, people have a hard time in those earlier stages of their lives thinking about retirement, all the way through to people actually approaching retirement and you know, again, whether they've saved or not, kind of thinking like, well, I don't know if I've actually saved enough. How do I know if I've saved enough? What am I going to do if I run out? Just not really having a clear sense of, um, you know, is it sufficient? Like what, what is out there? So they continue to struggle. Like it persists from early stages all the way through to um, retirement. The third piece is around um, the actual solution, which is that the truth is a workplace-based plan seems to be the most effective when it comes to um, producing better retirement outcomes for people. And we'll, we'll say people in general, but obviously employees uh, or members of that plan compared to if they are left to save on their own. So based on uh, a bunch of research that we did with Hoop, uh, and the Aspen Institute, we found that employee, employees are fit or people are 15 times more likely to save if they have access to a plan through their workplace that takes a payroll deduction. So they're not really having to think about it actively. It's just being taken off their payroll. And that goes up to 18 times if they're enrolled automatically at the time that they're offered the job. Like those are crazy numbers. Those could make a really big dent in those first four stats that we shared. Not to mention, you know, other reasons that workplace-based plans tend to provide better outcomes. There is group purchasing power. Um, obviously, the, the plans tend to have better rates and better access to advice and all, all sorts of things like that if they're through a group versus if you are somebody with not a huge uh, amount of money trying to save kind of on their own. You know, the third piece, which is like not unimportant, is that most people just don't do it if they're left alone. Again, to, to compare it to health benefits. Many of us, especially in Canada, because we have socialized healthcare, if we are if we don't have access to uh, private health insurance through our workplace, very very few people go out and purchase it on their own. This is like a very similar thing. People just don't. It's sort of seen as something that's done through your workplace or not at all. And so 
it tends to be um, much more effective for, for Canadians if it's offered through their place of work. And so we've got this kind of three layer cake that, um, you know, built the case for employers caring about the financial health of their employees, but like putting it all together, what does it actually mean? The, what we're trying, the picture we're trying to paint here is that there is a very real problem that your employees are probably dealing with. And employers are uniquely positioned to help solve this very real problem. And what this means is, is, is that your employees, if you help solve this problem, your employees are one step closer to being able to bring their whole self to work. And engagement evidence, uh, research, happiness research, satisfaction research, all of that stuff, the NPS scores that people are doing for their workplace, these have all shown that when employees can bring their whole self to work, when the anxieties of home are being cared for and supported through their workplace, they tend to stay longer. They tend to be more engaged, more creative, more innovative, which are all great things for both people personally and also the workplace. I think another like important point on this is that, um, I, you know, we're sharing this with you in terms of like making the case, but the truth is many employers have started to catch on. Again, similar to the health benefits. Uh, a recent study by the Bank of America showed that in back in 2012, 33% of employers said that they felt responsible at all for caring about their employees' financial health. That number is shot up to 78% in 2020. So over eight years, that's like a 45% increase in employers, you know, saying that they care about them, the, the financial, or they feel responsible, forget about even care, but they feel actually responsible for the financial health of their employees. And again, that, you know, I'd love to believe that that's out of the goodness of everybody's hearts. And I'm sure that in some ways it is, but it's also because of this evidence that like, if we can help employees or people take care of things that plague them, they can bring more of themselves into the workplace. They can focus and just do better and they stick around longer and all of those good things we talked about. Um, one last thing to note uh, for, before I hand it off to Alex is that Okay, I think the position that a lot of employers find themselves in is like, great, I buy it. Okay, I wanna help my employees show up at work better. I wanna support them, I care about this. Then they go out and they look around and it turns out the plans aren't that great for them. They're expensive, they don't have good outcomes for their employees. The truth is that existing workplace plans aren't exactly designed for all today. We still need to do a lot of work to get them there. The, and unfortunately, smaller and medium sized employers and low to modest income earners are largely underserved by the current workplace retirement plan offerings. Um, you know, we're, we certainly as a company are trying to change that. There are others who are working hard to do that. But in addition to that, I think a lot of what Alex is going to cover here is like, okay, when you're going, if you, if you do buy this and you are going out into the world looking for the plan, how can you think about effectiveness and um, like this as a real benefit to your employees. So we're going to share, you know, four more good ideas that you, you can definitely apply as you're looking at workplace-based plans, but also personally, these are, you know, these would work just as well for somebody who's trying to tackle this problem um, for themselves. And with that, I'll hand it over to Alex. Great. Thank, thank you, Nora. So um, the second idea we wanted to share is uh, about taking advantage of tax-free savings accounts. Now, a lot of people are aware of tax-free savings accounts. They've been around for a little bit over a decade, um, but they're underused and they're misunderstood. And we could make a lot better use of them both in the workplace and environment and also in people's personal uh, finances. So I'm gonna explain a little bit of, of why that is. Um, the first thing I wanted to share is that part of the reason the tax-free savings account was created is because RSPs can actually be quite bad for people living on a modest income. And I'll explain why, but if you wanna learn more about this, one great resource is the work that John Stapleton has done uh, in collaboration with the Metcalf Foundation about retiring on a low income. He's a very valuable guide. Um, he does education sessions in public libraries across the province, and he's a real expert on this and has taught us a lot about it. But uh, in a nutshell, uh, RSPs end up uh, resulting in the clawback of people's benefits in retirement, government benefits that are aimed at modest income people. Uh, and it can end up being a very bad deal uh, for modest income people 
Um, much of the financial services industry is not well trained on this, in part because they're not well set up to serve modest income people. Um, and so it's really just a caution to say that if, if someone is making uh, less than $50,000 a year and doesn't have a pension, and particularly if they're likely to get the guaranteed income supplement, uh, they'd be much better off saving in a TFSA. Now, to explain a little bit more about how this works, just the basics of this, people may be familiar with RSPs and TFSAs, but they might not fully understand the difference. Um, and so the difference from a tax perspective is really uh, when uh, tax is applied. So with an RSP, you get a deduction up front. You basically don't pay tax on any of the contributions you make. And so that's a nice thing in the here and now. But you do pay tax uh, later when you withdraw the money from what's called a RIF. So you're taxed on that. And it also affects your government benefits, your guaranteed income supplement, and your old age security. So whatever income you're taking out of an RSP will affect those government benefits. And especially for the GIS, the clawback rate can be very high. With the TFSA, you are taxed on those contributions. So that forms part of your taxable income when you contribute to the TFSA. Like an RSP, there's no tax on investment return. So that's a great feature of both programs. And then the nice thing with the TFSA is when you get to retirement, any money you take out doesn't attract any tax and has no effect whatsoever on your government benefits, your OAS and your GIS. Um, so that's a really important thing to take advantage of, um, especially if you're living on a more modest income. To explain a little bit more about how this works, let's take an example. So this is two people in retirement. They have money. Uh, one person is taking out $500 uh, a month from a TFSA. The other is taking $500 a month from a RIF, which is really the retirement part of an RSP. You have to convert an RSP into a RIF. Uh, for the first person, um, they have no effect on their guaranteed income supplement. They get the full, in this case, $500, just an illustrative example. For the second person, they are subject to what's called the GIS clawback, which means that 50% or more uh, of their GIS is reduced uh, for every dollar of RSP they take out. So in other words, they're taking out $500 from their RIF, and that reduces their GIS by 50%, and you can see a significant decrease in income. Uh, that's the feature of RSPs that many people are not aware of when they're told by their bank or whomever to put money in. If that person's going to get GIS, uh, there's a big clawback on the other end. So in terms of practical next steps of how you can use the TFSA, uh, number one would be to actually look at adding a group TFSA option to your workplace retirement plan if you have one. Uh, most workplace retirement plans are built around group RSPs or pension plans. Very, very few use the group TFSA. That's starting to change slowly right now. But in our view, it's, it's changing too slowly, and it would be great if more employers added this as an option. If you yourself are making less than $50,000 a year, particularly if you don't have a lot in savings or have zero in savings, don't have a pension plan, strongly consider using the TFSA as your primary retirement savings vehicle. Not a top up to the RSP, but as your primary vehicle, because it is a very effective retirement savings vehicle to preserve OAS and also to have income tax free in retirement. If you earn more than $50,000 a year, there's still a use for the TFSA, but it's more of a top up. You know, it might be a supplement to your RSP savings um, and an additional strategy of over and above your pension or RSP. Our third idea is about fees. Um, frankly, in Canada, we pay some of the highest fees in the world. Uh, Canadian investors, particularly those that are middle income and below, have been getting ripped off uh, for a long time. And this is one of the ideas in finance. Retirement, there's a lot of complex stuff here, but keeping fees low is a, is a pretty easy to understand idea. And it's something that everybody can work on to try and get more bang for their buck and their savings. One thing that um, not a lot of people know is that Canada is a world leader in high fees. We have some of the highest fees in the world. This has been shown by many studies. We're well above uh, the US, well above the UK, well above Australia and other kind of comparable um, nations. There's two main reasons for this. Uh, one is we don't have that much competition in financial services. It's dominated by a small group of banks, large banks and insurance companies. The second is our consumer financial protection is actually comparatively weak. We don't require a lot in terms of fee disclosure. Um, and so many people do not understand that they pay anything in fees or even what those fees are. That's again, starting to change but it's, it's happening quite incrementally. And so there is a role for employers and individuals in getting educated on how much they're paying and what the impact of that is 
on their future retirement income. So um, this is actually a very helpful tool if you want to understand the impact of fees. Um, a gentleman named Larry Bates, who's a former banker himself, so he was an insider and then he uh, basically uh, left the banking sector and started to write books about how people can um, better protect themselves in, when investing their money. And he's very passionate about lowering fees and he's built a calculator, which he calls the T-Rex score. And it's really about showing how much of your savings, how much the investment gains you earn are going to fees. So I've used his calculator here. You can see the, the link and we'll include it in the resources, but to illustrate that. So this is somebody who's investing $100,000 at a 5% rate of return, which is considered a reasonable return. Um, and who's paying annual fees of 2%, which is the Canadian average over a 25 year span. And in this example, the fees are actually eating up more than half of the total investment gains. So the T-Rex score is 46%, which is basically what you get to keep. And the rest of the portion goes to the financial institution in fees. That's a really significant amount of money. If you look at a typical person paying high fees or typical Canadian fees versus paying lower fees can mean retiring five years earlier or a significant amount more in retirement income. Uh, so you can see these look like small differences, 2% versus 1% versus 0.6%, but they really add up over time. So you know, what can you do from a fee perspective? Well, first of all, it's important to understand how much you're paying. If the group you're working with doesn't disclose that to you, you have a right to know may not be required by law, but if they don't want to tell you, that may raise some questions about whether you want to work with them. Um, there are also opportunities to seek out lower fee providers for your employees group savings plan. Uh, smaller employers tend to pay much higher fees, but there is more competition that's happening now. And that's a good thing to dig into, uh, work with your provider, figure out what you're paying today and to see if there are opportunities to lower that either with that provider or by shifting providers to somebody else so that your employees get a better deal. And this is especially important now because many people expect returns in the future to be lower than they have been in the past. And when returns are a bit lower, the cost of high fees is even more significant. In the same way that people get a real benefit from compound interest on their investments, that's a positive thing. There's also a negative, what people call sometimes, some people call it the tyranny of negative compounding, which is the longer you have money invested, the more of a penalty you pay for paying higher fees. Um, the other thing is for your own RSPs and TFSAs, find out how much you're paying, um, add that up. What does that cost you in dollar amounts? How much is it likely to cost you over a longer period of time? Use Larry's calculator and think about, am I actually getting value here? Many people will argue, well, you're getting advice. You're not just getting the investment product, you're also getting advice, but is it good advice? And is it actually advice that's aligned to your interest or is it really somebody who's there to try and sell you products? Um, our fourth idea is about providing education in accessing government benefits. And I think it's fair to say there's a lot of government benefits out there. Almost everybody is going to uh, be able to access some government benefits. Very few people understand these programs. And so there's a lot of value. You could argue this is one of the, the best bang for the buck you can get as an employer because you're helping your employees access free money. And I'll talk about a couple different kinds of government benefits. So the first is government retirement benefits. So a lot of people talk about our retirement system in terms of pillars. And the first pillar is really government benefits. So this is Canada Pension Plan, Old Age Security, and the Guaranteed Income Supplement. For a middle income Canadian, these are going to constitute probably 50% or more of somebody's income in retirement. So they're really, really important. And almost, almost nobody understands these programs. There are choices you can make with respect to these programs to help you get more money out of them. And a lot of people don't understand those. So helping people to understand that uh, makes a big difference. Also, as an employer, you pay into CPP. You are actually providing a pension plan to your employees through CPP. And be, because the CPP is being enhanced, your contributions are going up. So it, it would make sense for you to actually educate your employees on the benefit you are providing by paying into their CPP. That's not a tax, that's actually, you're mandated to do it, but it's a benefit to your employees that they're gonna receive. So you could think about that as part of your total comp and you're gonna be doing a service to your employees as well in educating them about what they're gonna get in the future. We don't have a good understanding as a population of these programs, despite their importance. Uh, many people think the CPP is not sustainable. Um, actually, the Chief Actuary of Canada says it's sustainable for the next 75 years. It's considered to be one of the most sustainable and well-run uh, public uh, pension plans in the world. Uh, many Canadians don't understand they can wait later to take their CPP and OAS, and that the longer they wait, 
the more they get in annual benefits. So you can wait as long as age 70. Many experts say that waiting is the best strategy for many people, yet only 1% of Canadians do this. So helping people understand that, especially as they're approaching retirement, you can actually get over $100,000 more, probably, depending on, on who you are, by waiting. Um, so it's worth at least having people consider that. Most people don't understand how much they're gonna get from these programs. So it's pretty hard to do retirement planning if you don't know where the sig a significant chunk of your income is gonna come from. And that can also reduce financial stress, by the way. If people feel, actually, you know what? There are gonna be some uh, guaranteed benefits I'm gonna get from the government. I feel a little bit better. So at least I have that base. And few people understand the interaction between these vehicles. Um, as we talked about earlier, the interaction, for example, between the guaranteed income supplement and TFSAs, the OAS and TFSAs. So what can you do to help? We talked about retirement benefits. There's also benefits people can access right now, many programs. Some of them are temporary with COVID. Some of them are more permanent programs that many of your employees could access. Uh, the non-for-profit Prosper Canada, who you may be familiar with, has built a very, very helpful tool called the Financial Relief Navigator. And this is a tool that anybody can access for free. And it is a tool to help you understand what benefits you might be entitled to. Uh, it's got some tools for short-term COVID-related benefits. It's got some tools for longer-term benefits. And this is a tool you or your employees can use for free uh, to, uh, by one of Canada's leading organizations when it comes to financial inclusion and financial health. So we'd encourage people to use that. Education savings is a key thing that people um, need some help with. And one government benefit is the Canada Learning Bond, uh, which is really for modest income families to help save for their kids' education. Those families are eligible for a grant of up to $2,000 per child. There's over a million children in Canada that are eligible that don't get this grant because people don't apply, they're not aware of the program. So I wanna make you aware of a resource called Smart Saver, which is a not-for-profit that we work with sometimes uh, devoted to help people access these grants and open RESPs. So they have a very simple to use digital tool that allows people to open an RESP very easily with a range of financial institutions of their choice. There's no fee, there's no minimum contribution, and you can get the Canada Learning Bond. So this is a good thing to incorporate into your financial education at work, because again, it's free money from the government and it helps people obviously save for their kids' education, which is an extremely important thing for them and their family. So uh, what can you do? Don't ignore government benefits when you're thinking about your workplace savings program. It's not just about the savings you offer, but it's also educating people on those government benefits. Look at ways to provide education on benefits people can access now, particularly in light of COVID and temporary benefits that people may be able to access but don't understand. And also for yourself or your employees, think about potentially the benefits of deferring Canada Pension Plan or old age security. Do the math uh, yourself. There are a number of calculators out there to help you with that um, or talk to somebody about whether that might make sense for you. So our fifth idea is a very simple one, uh, but it's a powerful one. And it's about making savings automatic. Um, as Nora said, many people defer savings. They don't like to deal with it. It's not necessarily a fun thing to do. And so if you can make it automatic, if you can make it kind of set it and forget it, that's a very powerful way to increase your or your employee's financial health. A couple of years ago, um, a gentleman named Richard Thaler won the Nobel Prize for Economics. And a lot of his work has been around developing behavioral nudges to help people improve their financial lives. And he said that basically um, the best application we've had so far of all the lessons from behavioral economics, which have taught us so much about human nature, have been in improving retirement savings. So there are proven interventions that are backed up by very robust science and evidence that we can apply in the workplace today to help people get better outcomes. One example of this is a technique called automatic escalation, which Richard Thaler, who invented this technique, along with some other researchers, they call it save more tomorrow. And that's really what it is. It's pre-committing uh, to automatically increasing your savings over time. Many people are starting from zero or starting from a low amount. They can't afford to save the 10 or 15% of their pay that they would eventually need to save to be retirement ready. Automatic escalation allows them to get started with a lower amount and then automatically increase those amounts over time. And this has been very, very successful in the US and the UK and other jurisdictions in getting people to increase their savings rate across the income spectrum. 
modest income, middle income, upper income, it's worked. And also people at the end of the day have been very happy that it's, that it's happened to them. So it's not, sometimes people think this is kind of like negative option billing, but actually it's money that you're saving for yourself and your family and people appreciate the help in doing that. So I'll show you an example of what this actually looks like within a plan. Um, this is within our system about how this looks, but this is an example of somebody that, you know, we're calculating should be probably saving around $900 a month to be retirement ready. But maybe they got student loans, they've got other near-term challenges, they can only afford 300. So what we're doing here is we're putting them on an automatic schedule to increase every year that amount until they kind of catch up to that level. And then we're kind of keeping place with inflation after that. It happens automatically. You can opt out of it at any time. There's nothing you need to do. In that way, we're making it automatic. So we'd love to see more of this adopted across workplace savings plans in Canada because we're behind a lot of these other jurisdictions. So what can you do to use automatic savings in the workplace? First is payroll deduction. Nora talked about it. It's a very, very powerful tool. Just not seeing the money is super helpful to people. So if you facilitate payroll deduction, even if it's just voluntary savings, that can be very helpful. Uh, make signing up easy. More friction you can take out in signing up for a retirement plan, which people find very overwhelming to begin with, the easier it's gonna be. You can minimize the number of choices. Generally, we find that the fewer choices you make someone select, the better the outcome and the more likely they are to sign up. If you have 40 different investment choices and you don't know anything about investments, you just often get overwhelmed. You say, you know what, this is too hard for me. We're not going to do it. Instead, if you say, you know what, we have a default for somebody who's your age, um, and, and this is what most people choose, that makes it easier for people. So try and streamline that. And then see if you can use something like automatic escalation to help you or your employees save more tomorrow. I did want to mention a project um, that we're collaborating on with Maytree and a number of other uh, foundations and organizations in the community sector which is really an effort to bring together a lot of these ideas in a portable plan that's accessible to a lot of the groups Nora mentioned that have been left out of the traditional retirement savings system, small and medium employers, small and medium not-for-profits and small businesses, uh, freelance workers, um, people in the gig economy, trying to bring together a program that combines automatic savings, low fees, education on government uh, benefits, uh, and the portability uh, to suit a modern economy. Uh, we're gonna be launching this in Q1 of 2021, uh, there are probably some folks on the phone that are already signed up. Uh, we have 100 employers from across the country that are, that are signed up for this already. If you're interested in learning more, you can contact us uh, through the website that's listed here and find out more about how you can uh, be part of this program beginning in 2021. Um, so just to recap the five ideas, uh, Nora talked about the strong business case that's actually behind um, improving workplace-based financial health. Um, we covered the advantages of TFSAs, particularly for modest income earners. We talked about the impact of fees uh, and how uh, that can mean hundreds of thousands of dollars more retirement income if you're able to lose uh, lower fees for, for employees. We talked about the importance of understanding government benefits both in retirement and today and how that's essentially free money that you can generate for you uh, and your employees if you better understand these programs. And we talked about the power of automatic savings, harnessing some of the uh, insights from behavioral economics to help people save more tomorrow, to help them save more automatically and to overcome some of these just features of human nature that make it very difficult for us to save for the future. Um, we've listed some resources here. These are available on the Maytree website, uh, but there are links to many of the things that, uh, that we've mentioned in our presentation. I'll also give a shout out to the work that the Ontario Securities Commission has done in providing a really high quality set of financial education resources on a broad range of topics from budgeting and lots of other things we didn't cover today. Uh, so that's a great resource for you and your employees. And um, with that, uh, that ends our presentation and we'll look forward to the Q&A. Um, well, I'll be the first to say that was terrific. That was just great, Alex and Nora, that uh, was incredibly, um, focused and and accessible in terms of getting at, at things that many of us are really afraid to have uh, conversations about because it's complex um, and it makes us nervous. So thank you for taking us through that. And um, I thought it was a powerful business case. Um, as I think you were finishing the business case, the first question came up from, from, the, from the audience. So we're gonna start there. Um, and I think it's um, an interesting question. Are we admitting that Canadians don't have the willpower to save for retirement and we need to be compelled to do so through interventions by employers? 
there's a second part to this, but we'll start there. Yeah, I, I can start and Nora, if you want to jump in, like, I think there's, there's a lot of ground in between forced savings and leaving it all to the individual. It doesn't have to be like uh, one or the other. So if you look at some of the behavioral interventions, these are actually nudges to help people do what they want to do. So if you actually ask Canadians what they want, many of them want to retire. Many of them think retirement savings are important. So it's not like you're asking the people to do something against their will, but they're asking for help in doing it to make it easier is really what, what this is about at the end of the day. Um, I don't think there's that many people out there who would say, I'm willingly looking to take a, a, a decrease in my standard of living in retirement, um, but they need help in doing it. And employers can play an important role in, in providing that assistance. I also think like in terms of that notion of helping, like it, it's not so much that they need to be compelled. It's, it's that, as we mentioned several times, like the industry can be a little bit confusing. Financial stuff in general, not just saving for retirement, but like just financial stuff can be really confusing. And we all just have so much going on. And, you know, in that slide where we talked, I talked about like, there's just so many reasons to put off thinking about this particular thing. So instead of thinking about it as like, you know, the only way people will do it is if they're compelled through their employer. It's like, this is something really important. People care about it as Alex is saying, like they want to do it. They just like, as an employer, you're in a position to help in a very like unique way, why not take advantage of that versus thinking about it as like, they just won't do it unless they're compelled to. I mean, yeah. I hope that's not true. No, and then you're not treating them as a child. You're actually just uh, helping them do something that's very complicated um, without, without sort of supports around to make it happen. Um, the second part is more technical. Um, secondly, do employers take responsibility for the rate of returns that employees get through direct intervention of employer? What's the, how do you navigate that? Yeah, that, that's a very interesting question, right? Um, I think that in the past, we've put a lot of responsibility on employers for what you might call the operation of retirement savings and pension plans. So in a world where employees stayed with the same employer for 40 years or 50 years, not 50 years, but uh, their whole career, it, you know, it made sense for the employer to take on responsibility for that whole life cycle. You know, in the, in the new world of work where people are changing jobs more often, we need to make it easier for employers. So we need to have structures where the employer doesn't have to do all that much. It'd be great if the employer matched. It'd be great if the employer provided education. But they need a structure, especially if they're smaller and mid-sized, where they can take, they can, they can access something they can trust, where they don't have to, you know, choose all of the investments, monitor all the investments, take responsibility for that. So ideally, they don't have liability for that kind of thing. You've got a a provider that is trustworthy that has that kind of liability. Um, the employee also has some of that liability too by making choices, but you have to make the choices easy and you have to have smart defaults. Um, larger employers may want to take on that liability. They may want to have their own plan uh, and that's great. And they've always had the capacity to do that. But for small and medium and for others, uh, we need to make it easier. Right. Um, I'm looking at the time. We said that we were going to wrap this up at 1.45, but the questions are coming in. So if, um, if you two are able to stay on the line a bit longer and engage in some Q&A, um, we will, you know, for, this recording will be available to others. And those of you in the audience who want to stay with us, we will certainly cut it, have a hard cut off before two o'clock. But we're going to go a little bit longer because there's some great questions coming in, if that's okay. It's good. Excellent. Sure. Um, this question from Mark. Uh, my question is, as an employer, if I set up a TFSA plan with the intention that it's used for retirement, um, staff will have the option of pulling the money out immediately, which defeats the purpose. I, I understand this is part of a bigger picture with staff living in debt, but just want to know if you've had any advice to ensure TFSA was used for retirement versus current cash needs for staff, as many of our staff would... As for, as for many of our staff, they would do better having a TFSA. I realize they can pull from an RSP, but there's a penalty, there's disincentive. How do you prevent, how do you create a disincentive for withdrawing from a TFSA? Yeah, I might reframe that question a little bit, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I think the goal is we're trying to improve the financial security of the workforce, the financial health of the workforce. And we know that there's a strong link between the short term and the long term. So I would argue that the ability to withdraw penalty-free, tax-free from a TFSA is a feature, not a bug, when it comes to retirement savings. Um, we know that actually if uh, someone is modest income and they, they know they're not going to be able to access the money 
and they know that there's going to be a penalty if they withdraw, they're much less likely to save in the first place because they're concerned about that money being locked up. So there's been a lot of studies that show if you, if you can help people build an emergency savings, that's gonna make them more likely to save for retirement with confidence. So there are ways of emphasizing retirement savings. You can't lock up a TFSA, but you can communicate it as a retirement savings vehicle. You can make the investment options retirement oriented. You can provide retirement education. You can talk about the value of compounding and leaving the money in. But I would discourage folks from having the attitude that any withdrawal is a bad thing. It actually might mean that those savings are helping somebody address the short-term need, which actually is helping you as an employer to increase the financial security of the, of the workforce. Well, it's, rec it's recognizing that our, our financial security and insecurity may go up and down during our lifetime. And so it, it's about that protection. Yes. And leaving it to the discretion. Nora? Yeah, I think it's also about like education, right? So helping people understand like what, you know, as you said, our financial security goes up and down. So like what is a good enough reason to interrupt my retirement savings and take this money out of a TFSA? And then it's trusting your employees. Like we don't want to be sort of parental in this respect. We want to be so, uh, yeah, we just want to educate people. So we want them to be informed and, and then, you know, their financial decisions are their own. Like whether it's you're withdrawing from an RSP or a TFSA, you have to own that decision. But we like what we, what we're encouraging here is like provide information for people to understand why it may not be the best idea to take it out of the TFSA for this one thing, but maybe it is. Okay, great. Um, this question may be answered in the resources you've provided, but it might be a quick answer as well. Uh, from Bryn, is there a resource you would suggest that explains the income threshold at which RSPs become beneficial for people? Helpful to know that you've pegged it at around 50,000. Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a yeah, somewhat debated question. I think um, the things that drive it um, really are a couple things. One is, are, is somebody likely to get GIS? Uh, that's hard to predict when somebody is young mm -hmm. because you don't know what their income trajectory is going to be. Uh, as they get older, about a third of Canadians get GIS. So it's quite a few people. So if someone's approaching retirement and they don't have really much in the way of savings, um, it, it's generally better to, to, to go in TFSA. Um, the other thing that drives it is tax rates. So if your tax rates are likely to be much lower in retirement, then RSP tends to be uh, quite a bit better. Um, so during higher income years, your tax rates are, are going to be a little bit higher, um, and then that's likely to drop in retirement. So um, rules of, I mean, I think the resource we've shared that's probably most relevant to this is the John Stapleton um, work, but you can also read things by people like Rob Carrick, who's the personal finance columnist for the Globe, who's written quite a lot about uh, TFSAs and where they're appropriate. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Patricia. For very small organizations, health insurance is often only offered if you have three or more employees. Are there similar restrictions for payroll deduction, RSP, and TFSA plans? Is there a minimum? No idea. There yeah, there can be. Um, you know, not to like brag, but we don't have that. <laughs> we don't have a restriction on that, but there can be. It depends on who the provider that you're talking to is. Sometimes they have minimum thresholds and things like that. It Again, very similar to that health space where it's taken a long time to even get down to three. It used to be much higher than that. So hopefully that changes, but. Great. Um, uh, here's an interesting question from Isaac, very time sensitive. Um, how do you approach adopting an automatic payroll deduction when employees may be especially struggling currently due to the pandemic? And again, our situation in life changes uh, over time. How do you manage that? Well, you know, I think it's it's good to have conversations with your employees about this stuff. I mean, it's a tough it's a tough issue to talk about sometimes, but it can also be an opportunity to have a dialogue with your employees and show that you you care about their financial lives. So, you know, it could be, hey, we're thinking about putting this in, but wanted to check with you about the timing because we know people are struggling right now and have different needs. Um, not to go back to the TFSA again, but that is one advantage of the TFSA. If you have payroll deduction for TFSA and people need the money, they can access it. And maybe during COVID, you want to change your messaging a little bit. So it's less about you need to keep this money in for retirement, a little bit more about we understand people are struggling. And that's why we want to use a vehicle that's a little bit more um, liquid and accessible to people. Okay. Um, here's a question. This, I think, probably speaks to a lot of the people in our, in our audience, um, thinking specifically for small nonprofits. What is the cost to the employer for providing retirement options? Uh, like the ones you've described, what will it cost the employer? 
Nora, do you want to speak to that? Um, it, it, dep it depends on the plan you go with. Um, the way that most or many plans are structured are those fees actually go to the employee and not the employer. So uh, one of the things that Alex talked about was looking for those low fees. And often the reason that that becomes difficult in a workplace plan or when you're going up personally is because a lot it's, you know, a lot of the cost is baked into the investment fees. And so it hits the employees. There are plans, you know, the, the marketplace is changing again and there are plans emerging where the employer can offset some of those costs um, through subscription fees per employee in exchange for a lower fee. So I guess the, the, the sort of clear answer is it can range from it can cost the employer nothing, but that cost is going to be incurred by the employee or you can kind of like look for plans that you as an employer, you can offset those costs for your employees for in exchange for better rates, which is again, like effect, more effective outcomes. Yeah, one, one way to think about it uh, is like, you want to make sure that if you're introducing a program, it's improving the quality of your compensation package. So the effectiveness in that of that package and attracting and retaining people and ensuring like a productive, you know, engaged workforce. So, you know, I'd encourage you to think about it as part of total compensation and maybe it's even a substitute for salary. You know, there've been interesting polls. There's one done by Hoop recently to say that most Canadians over 75% would be prepared to take, accept a lower salary in exchange for a high quality retirement plan. And your employees may be in that 75%. You need to make sure it's high quality, um, but your biggest cost is likely to be any matching contributions you're gonna make. There are administrative costs that are sometimes associated with these things, but the big cost is if you wanna match three, four, 5%, that obviously makes your plan more effective, um, but that's, that, that would be the main cost. Um, I'm particularly taken personally with, with your idea number four, which is education on government benefits uh, through the workplace, uh, because I think that there's an extraordinary number of government benefits that get left on the table that people never claim or, or, or take advantage of. Um, do you have examples of, of, of good practices of how to deliver that kind of education in the workplace? Uh, that, it, does that become an HR function? How, how do you provide that education in a way that is respectful, that is respects the privacy of the employees, but also um, helps to connect them? Like I think that the navigator, the, the benefit screen tools that, that Prosper has have developed have been just terrific in that way. Um, and so how do we begin to actually tech, like, tactically, how do we put that in place, operationalize that in our workplace? Yeah, Nora, you want to start off? Yeah, I think I think you need to know your workplace and like presumably you know your workplace best. So there could be different ways. If you have um, an HR department that is seen as like a trusted resource and a source of confidentiality, I think it's great to come from them. I mean, obviously I'm in HR, so like I'm a little biased, um, but I think it's great to come from them because they're often already seen as sort of like the ones who care for these kinds of things when it comes to your employees and they're sort of, they're trusted to provide this kind of information. If you either don't have an HR department at all, or there are other reasons why it may not make sense to have this information come through them. I think actually reaching out to organizations like Prosper and Smart Saver and all of those orgs there, from my experience, and Alex can speak to this more, they've been more than happy to like share that. And sometimes having that third party come in and share that information makes it feel just far enough away that like, if you need it, you don't feel like you're having to expose yourself to your employer in a way that you may not be comfortable with. So again, it comes back to the culture of your organization and how would they feel about you? You know, what is their relationship like with the leadership and the, and the HR department before you? I, I have this like mantra that you don't want your message to be lost in its delivery. So it is critical. Like, I love that question. It's critical that you you know, think about the best possible way to get that education, that information out to your employees versus like wanting it to come from one particular place over another. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, this is an exciting area, right? It's a new area. It hasn't really been done in the workplace. Uh, but as government programs become more complex and more important in our lives, it's going to become more, more of an opportunity to help people. So um, I don't think we have a clear idea of exactly how to do it. Our philosophy has been, let's work with experts that specialize in this. So for example, Smart Saber, all they do is help people get the kind of learning bond and open RESPs. Not a simple thing, actually. And they've developed really easy tools. So, you know, for common good, we partnered with them. Um, and I think that like ultimately, and we, you know, we can provide education on government retirement benefits because that's the area that we know, but we don't know education savings. And ultimately it'd be great if providers, if this became kind of a standard thing that your provider did, you know, 
Um, you, they, they're just in providing that education. It's turnkey for the employer. The employer doesn't have to become an expert on GIS. I mean, it's pretty mm. complicated. Uh, they're busy and they can just look to their providers to help with that stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's like we have employee assistance programs, EAPs, that provide all kinds of supports and advice and that type of thing. And remember at the beginning of the pandemic, ours sent us a message saying if people need, you know, online counseling or other things, this should be an element like that where you can just easily access it and it gets delivered. And it's a third party, so there's not that awkwardness of my employer judging whether or not I need a benefit. There's I mean, the other idea is tax filing, you know, mm -hmm. tax filing clinics. There are groups out there that provide free tax filing clinics. Some of them are doing that through the workplace. There could be more of that. That's a fantastic opportunity because so many government benefits are linked to filing taxes. Many Canadians uh, don't know exactly how to, you know, get the most when they're filing. Because again, taxes are not easy and yep. they're something people don't want to talk about. So that could also become a form of workplace benefit. Yep. I think that's... I think we're going to leave it there. Um, as you were talking, and I, I mean, I was, I learned a lot today. I learned every time I listened to, to you guys. So <laughs> thank you. Um, and I think my, my sixth, my personal good idea is I need to just do the math. I need to sit down and do the math as, you know, what is it actually going to calculate out? Because, and I, I think I'm typical. I, I think about, uh, you know, the savings in the abstract, but do I actually have the hard numbers in front of me? And there's a, there's this weird phobia, I think, for, for getting to do the numbers and, and figure out what am I losing to the, to the, to the fees? What am I, what's projected? All of those things. And it's do the math. Anyway, sorry, Alex, you want, you want a final word. Well, no, I was just going to say, like, <laughs> if you take, that's, I think it's a great suggestion, Elizabeth, right, for everybody. You know, if you take the ideas we talked about, each one of them could be worth tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to people. So mm -hmm. if you think about the value you could get from that hour or two you spend just starting to do the math or taking that next step, it's well worth it, right? That might be one of the best hours you spend for your own financial health. So, I love And it. most of us have a bit of time right now in quarantine. <laughs> Nora, do you want a final word? No, thank you again so much. This was really fun. All right. Well, I want to thank um, both of you uh, for a great session, a good conversation, great answers to the questions, and just tremendous content. Um, thank you to our online audience for joining us today. As I said, um, this is going to be posted on our website. Uh, thank you for taking the time. Everyone is busy, and I know everyone is kind of Zoomed out, so taking the time to join the Zoom, we appreciate. Um, if you haven't done so already, please sign up for our Five Good Ideas newsletter at www.maytree.com. That way you will find out when our next session will be and who our next guest speaker will be, and it's in the chat room right now. Thank you, Aretta. And to everyone, have a wonderful afternoon and thank you for joining us.